Is that creativity? Well, it's creativity if it's not acting within the scheme that we had previously. So we'll start with the question of is whether the universe is purely material or our imagination and creativity beyond the laws of the physical world. So Roger, perhaps you could start by helping us with this word material and how to understand it. I hope I can, but I'm afraid it might, I might just confuse people. The trouble is since quantum mechanics, when I say that, I mean the physics which in the 20th century was developed, uh, starting with Max Planck and people like Einstein got very much involved. But there, you think of things which you might ca consider as particles and they behave like waves. So is this distinction between what you think of as particle-like or stuff, re material in some sense, or just wavy things, waviness or something. And the trouble is that according to quantum mechanics, everything which behaves like particles at one level will behave like waves at another. And when I say at level, it's really a question of when you're talking about a fre frequency, a very high frequencies, things behave more like particles. And at very low frequencies, they behave like waves. Now, is this distinction sort of removed now? Seems to me it's, it's not the kind of distinction that physicists like to make. Um, you might think of, well, electromagnetic, the light, light, you see, electromagnetic waves. At one level, these are photons, these are individual particles. And depending on what kind of experiment you're talking about, you might consider them as a sort of wave-like entities in some field which is not intrinsically particle-like, in one's imagination at least, or things which, um, well, I mean, any, anything which behaves as a particle at high frequencies will behave like a wave at low frequencies. It's not always that we know how to do this. For example, with gravity, you do have things like called gravitational waves, but nobody has ever notice the p particulate nature of gravity which should in principle be there but that depends on combining Einstein's general relativity with quantum mechanics in ways which um, haven't been achieved at least I don't think they've been achieved <laughs> yes um, very interesting um, of course Roger and um, first one would say that there are so many meanings to the word material <coughs> um, and we were talking about this earlier and Roger was saying it's not really a word that scientists would now use um, because of our knowledge of the nature of what we used to call particles and fields but one important way in philosophy is to somehow de designate lumpen matter that has nothing to do with consciousness it is simply objective and there and if you are such a materialist, I say you're not somebody who overvalues matter, but somebody who undervalues matter. Because according to your theory, if you leave matter alone for a few million years, it'll start producing bars St. John Passion, which is a very extraordinary thing for that lump of matter to do. So you're forced to accept that matter and consciousness are not entirely distinct and i'm sure there are people probably including roger who disagree with this but fortunately there are very very many physicists who do say that we cannot consider <coughs> matter apart from consciousness entirely but i i take the position that matter is something that we've never directly experienced there are aspects of experience that we call material that's as close as we get. We experience consciousness directly. We know consciousness through consciousness, but we know matter only through our consciousness as an aspect of it. And I take the view that matter is a, a form or phase of consciousness that offers um, a certain degree of permanence and a certain degree of resistance for a while. And permanence and resistance are very important in creativity, extremely important balancing um, flow with per permanence and um, balancing um, uh, the, the, the sort of um, 
the force that pushes in a certain direction with something that actually resists it. It's out of that resistance often that things come, as the colours of light come out of a, a, a prism uh, um, uh, that, 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 that splits the, the, the single light. That, those are the sort of thoughts I, I have about it. But I would say that nowadays very few people are reductive materialists in this old-fashioned way. Physics is against it, experience is against it, and reason is against it. People like Einstein and Schrodinger and Dirac were a bit more polite than I am. They say the theory is incomplete. I'm saying the theory is actually self-inconsistent, so I'm a bit ruder than they were. But it needs something to be done, and that's where a bit of creativity absolutely is necessary. It's a very thrilling illustration of openness and creativity within science, but I want to come to you in a moment, Esther, but I think, Ian, you wanted to come back on that. Well, yes, I mean, obviously... Um, uh, I'm, I'm just a, a, a child in relation to, to Roger on, on physics. But enough people in physics would take a different position that consciousness does actually affect what we perceive. And um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the trouble is that talking about an inconsistency or a paradox um, is not necessarily a sign that we're getting it wrong. It may be that we need to expand the way in which we think about our knowledge. Um, here I can't forbear mentioning something that I'm well known for, the differences between the attention paid by the right and the left hemisphere. And the left hemisphere values above all and sees fixity, certainty, um, the, the known and familiar, um, and brooks no uh, possibility of complexity of an implicit nature, whereas the right hemisphere sees that what is, is complexly interrelated, interacting, and that there is no, ultimately, no certainty. There is no uh, sort of perfection, as it were, that is the real truth, that it is a journey. And I think that's a very important idea. Philosophy is a process, and science is a process. And I believe reality is in process. Go on, Ian. No, could I just ask Roger? I mean, um, my understanding, such as it is, of quantum field theory, is that this, in some ways spans this problem of resolving Einstein's theory of relativity with quantum mechanics. Um, I think we have to make a point yeah, clear sorry, here. Sorry. This is special relativity. You see, quantum field theory certainly arose from yeah. making quantum mechanics broaden it into a theory which is consistent with the special theory. Special, of relativity. yes. So it's not talking about gravity. No. So it's a different story. I mean, sure, it's important to get it consistent with special... I think there are problems with quantum field theory. You keep running into infinities and things like this, and, yes. and there are all sorts of ways that the people in the area deal with them, shovel them under the carpet one way or another. And yes. I, I don't like that myself. I think I'd like a theory where you don't have to... Um, sort of rub your infinities out. If the number gets so big, then you can ignore it. That seems to be the point of view. That's what happens when you follow the quantum field theory idea, yes, yes. because it's, it's certainly trying to bring special relativity. When I say, I should mention, that is the theory of relativity in where you don't talk about gravitational fields. So special relativity is to do with how things behave under motion, Yes. but sort of uniform motion, and yes. you're not thinking about this what keeps us in our seats here. No, no, no. So no. It's, it's a different subject. But general relativity, which was Einstein's huge, yeah. incredible, I, I consider, uh, it came basically out of the blue, I think. If you want creativity, yes, this is a real yes, example yes. of it. The well, special relativity was more or less forced on people. And, yes. and to make that consistent with quantum theory and make quantum field theory, and as you were saying, the ideas of quantum field theory arose mm. out of that mm. union. Yes, but, yes, quite. But the general theory of relativity yes. is a different yes. story. Do you, would you accept David Tong, you know, he's the, for those who don't know, he's a professor of physics at Cambridge, his view that ultimately there is no discontinuity, that discontinuity is an emergent arising out of continuity. I think that's a very important point, actually, myself. When you say discontinuity, are we talking about the collapse of the wave function? Because that's you can do yes, because that is one of them. Yeah. But but what what I would want to say about that is that, and I think I'm in, not entirely out of touch with with some of the last century's physicists, that these are different ways of the same phenomenon existing exhibiting itself. It is a wave, but also it can be quantized for. 
as under certain circumstances. But that quantization is not the ground of it. The ground is its continue, its flow, its state as a wave. And the other, um, certainly de Broglie would have would have said this, that the the, the discontinuities arise out of that and on top of that. But hooray for approximation and hooray for, you know, things that don't completely fit because these are the things that strive, make us strive for further illuminations in which we might have to accept that there is no final certainty or precision. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.